Good afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started with the session on recognition, goal, and model reasoning. Our first talk will be Tathagata, who won the honorable mention for best dissertation award on his topic, Foundations of Human Aware Planning, a Tale of Three Models. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I am Tathagata from Arizona State University. Uh, first of all, thank you for this honor and giving me the opportunity to talk about my thesis again here. Uh, the topic of my thesis is Foundations of Human Aware Planning, um, a Tale of Three Models. Um, so let's begin with what we mean by uh, human aware planning. So as we know, the, the topic of sequential decision making is about finding out what to do next, like what is the correct sequence of decisions to make. Um, however, most of the systems in the real world do not, are not standalone systems. Uh, they work with humans in the loop, and so we have to be able to model their beliefs, intentions, and expectations of the systems that we are building. Um, however, most of the work in planning traditionally has been in dealing with standalone systems. We do not model the humans uh, explicitly, um, and that can lead to all sorts of uh, problems in terms of teaming and, uh, and in terms of explaining behaviors as well. So, uh, for example, uh, here's human aware planning gone, gone wrong. Uh, like two hours before I defended my thesis, Google came up with this uh, uh, news recommendation uh, about a news article about how uh, a student failed their defense. So it's not just about modeling the human, it's about doing it correctly. And that's the uh, goal of this thesis. How can we model the human uh, in a way that will help our planning systems uh, in order to interact with the human in the loop? So what are these three models? Well, uh, to begin with, we have the traditional view of the, uh, the planning problem. There's an agent and with a model. Uh, and given the model, we can find a plan. Um, however, when you are working with the human, what you are dealing with is joint plans. So the plans have some parts that are coming from the human and some parts that are coming from the robot. And so um, there's a task model of the human involved in this uh, process. So that's the second model. Uh, this model allows you to anticipate what you can get from the human and how you can deal with the human uh, explicitly. So how you can team with them, how you can avoid them, how you can assist them, etc. There's also the third model, which is the expectation that the human has on the um, robot. So uh, this allows you to conform to the expectations of the uh, human. Or if you cannot conform to those expectations, it allows you to explain your behavior in terms of the differences in those expectations. So these are the three models uh, that form the core of the human aware planning task. Uh, the robot's own model, the, the human's task model, and the human's mental model of the robot. So in the first part of the talk, I will briefly go over uh, how you can use the human task model to produce uh, novel behaviors uh, with the human. So the running example that I will use in the talk is that of a search and rescue domain. So there's a human and a robot involved in a search and rescue task. Um, and what, the, uh, what specifically we are going to look at is how you can use the human model uh, to coordinate with the human by, without having to communicate uh, that much. So in general, you can use the human task model to do teaming in the, in the general sense. Uh, in my thesis, I looked at the specific problem of minimizing uh, communication. Uh, so interaction without prior coordination, or IPC as we call in this room. Uh, so two very specific ways of looking at this is uh, what I called uh, planning with resource conflicts. So these are things. Uh, these are ways to plan uh, when there are conflicts with the human's intentions and how you can avoid those conflicts by planning around the human inter in intentions. And then there's the uh, idea of actually uh, affecting the human's plan. And so that's planning for serendipity. When you are actually uh, improving the human's uh, plan by changing parts of the world uh, in order to make their plan better. So for example, uh, while if you're, if you're dealing with conflicts, one thing as the robot that you can do is to figure out what the possible uh, human plans are and try to compromise on your own optimality to preserve the human's intentions. So that's the compromise part of it. But you can also use artifacts of the human's plan to improve your own original plan. And that's the opportunism part of it. Because the human's involvement in the same process 
um, actually helps part of your planning problem. Uh, similarly, for planning for serendipity, we looked at this idea of how to, uh, how to help the human when the human doesn't expect it. So here, the, the, the human is uh, going to uh, do a triage in the, in the location at the top left, and they are going to pass by the, the corridor regardless of what the robot does. So the robot is anticipating that behavior and trying to uh, put a med kit on the way so that the, the human does not have to go and fetch it. So this kind of behavior, again, improves the human's uh, uh, plan, um, and the robot is able to do it without any uh, communication. So I won't go into the details of these algorithms, but the key takeaways here uh, is that uh, you can use abstract representations of the expected plans of the, uh, of the human to come, up with these, uh, uh, to come up with the reasoning techniques of how to um, assist or avoid or team with the human. And one of the ways, one of the things that I looked at in, in this part of the work is to how to use integer program-based planners to, uh, to model those um, complex constraints with the human in the loop. So that's about the human uh, task model. The real uh, part of it that I would want to focus on in this talk is the human mental model. So that's the expectation that the human has on the uh, robot. So one of the one of the problems that comes with having expectations is when the ex those expectations are wrong. Um, so that means that if the human, if the robot is doing the best possible plan it can, because the human's expectations are different, uh, even if the robot is doing the best it can, the human would find better alternatives. So those we call inexplicable plans, because the, the plans of the robot are being evaluated by the mental model, not the actual model. So as a robot, you have two options here. Uh, you can make explicable plans, which means that you sacrifice optimality in your own model, but try to be explicable to the human or conform to their expectations. Or you can make explanations. So you can be optimal in your own plan and uh, provide explanations when the expectations diverge. So uh, let's look at a brief demo of what this looks like. So back in the search and rescue domain, uh, the, the robot here is uh, searching uh, a map, and the external here is the human who is not present in the scene, but has access to the map. And what often, often happens in those scenarios is because it's a disaster uh, scene, part of the map would have evolved from the actual bl blueprint of the building. So the, the external commander of the human would have started with one version of the map, and it would have changed during the, the process of the operation. So then there would be rubble that have closed off parts of the path. There might have been walls that have collapsed, so new paths may have opened up. So the plans that the robot will be making would be diverging from the expectations of the human. And so the question is, how does the, uh, does the robot reconcile with this diverging model? So in this example, um, the first plan that you're looking at, this one, is uh, where the robot is actually clearing off obst obstructions uh, in order to make a plan that is closer to what the human would expect. Um, what that means is that the, hu the robot here is doing a suboptimal plan uh, just to make sure that the, that the, that the plan looks uh, closer to optimal in the human's, ex uh, human's mental model. Um, in the explanation scene, the robot would ignore that plan and would be optimal to itself, so it's taking a different route. And in the top left, uh, it was giving explanations of what more changes have happened in the model. Um, so that this plan now makes sense. So uh, that's the uh, usual scene with planning with the mental model. So um, if you're trying to be explicable, though, you can't use the mental model directly. That's because the uh, human's expectation might be so far off that it's too costly for you or it's infeasible. So for example, if the human expects you to fly and you cannot fly this, then there's no way you can be explicable. Um, so the usual way of generating ex explicable plans is to not use that model directly, but use that as a guidance or heuristic in the search to get towards more and more explicable plans. So, so what happens if um, explanations, if uh, explicable plans do not exist? The other side of the coin of dealing with uh, model differences is this idea of explanations. And this explanation, uh, one of the uh, key parts of my thesis is looking at how you can take the human's expectation into account while giving those explanations. So an explanation cannot be a soliloquy. 
You cannot be talking to yourself with respect to your own model, because the reason that explanation was required in the first place is that the human had a defined expectation of your model. So, um, so we came up with this um, notion of model reconciliation um, as a way to formalize the explanation process. And, and the way we look at this is even, so the starting point is that the robot has produced a plan, um, and the explanation is in the form of a model update to the human, so that at the end of the process, both of them agree that that's the best plan possible. So the plan is both optimal in the robot's model and in the updated human model. And this sort of an explanation actually has uh, uh, some basis in the literature um, in social sciences and in human-human uh, interactions that look at the social contrastive and uh, selective properties of explanations. I won't go into the details of that. Uh, particularly about the contrastive property, uh, what we are doing here is we are making sure that the human cannot come up with better alternatives once the explanation process is over. So the contrastive property is that we are contrasting against all possible plans. One of the um, key findings of this uh, sort of a setup is that there are many ways you can find this model update. Um, so we looked at um, different forms of these explanations. Um, some of them have uh, conflicting properties. So for example, you might be trying to minimize the amount of information in the explanation. Uh, you might be trying to minimize the amount of time it takes to generate the explanation. And we looked at these different kind of explanations uh, different properties of these explanations um, in our HK paper. But uh, one thing I would uh, like to point out is, is the explanation MC and MME, which are uh, very uh, curious ways of uh, finding explanations. MC here uh, is the minimal amount of information that needs to be given to the uh, human so that they can make sense of the plan, while MMEs are the minimal amount of information that gets, needs to be given to the human uh, and after which the explanation never becomes invalid. Um, and it, it turns out that uh, computationally, depending on the amount of uh, model difference between the human and the robot, MMEs and MCs can be uh, more difficult or easier to find. Um, but the way we go about finding these explanations is what we call model space search. And the idea of model space search is to search in the space of models that are uh, enabled by the differences in the two models, the, the robot's model and the, uh, and the human's mental model, and find the model in the, that where the optimality condition holds, so where we can contrast the given plan with the space of possible plans. So going back to our discussion on the differences in models and what to do with it, for a human-aware planner then, the real question is uh, how can we balance these ideas so we can explain we can be explicable. Uh, so the, from the traditional uh, planning point of view, we are not making a plan given a model. We are finding out which is the model that we should plan in, given the mental model and the robots model. And so we, we actually uh, looked at variations of this model space search, where we saw how we can balance this off optimally uh, and find even shorter explanations than uh, minimally complete explanations. And uh, that's, that's the same algorithm that was going on in the video demo that we saw, uh, where we were changing the parameters of the algorithm to figure out whether the robot should explain or the robot should be explicable. Um, of course, uh, the uh, human-aware planning is not complete without actually evaluating that with humans. Uh, so we actually did a, a slew of studies to figure out how humans responded to these different behaviors. Uh, in particular, we abstracted out different parts of the, the search and rescue domain and presented that to the user uh, to see how they responded to these uh, kind of explanations. Um, we did this experiment in two parts. One, where we actually asked the humans to be the explainers and try to match that with the different kind of explanations that we came up with. Um, and um, two of the key findings, one, was that in certain circumstances, in limited communication, they actually matched the MC and, MM and uh, MPs that we looked at before. Uh, also, they did come up with other explanations that we did not look at in, in our work, uh, which also kind of informs uh, what other kinds of explanations that we can use in this process. We also flipped the table and said, evaluate the explanations that we did come up with, and are they happy with those explanations? Um, and in most cases, they were actually able to find out the key properties of the explanations. Uh, of the plans that the exp explanations were trying to preserve. 
so that's indicative of the fact that the, uh, that the theoretical properties that the explanations we're trying to preserve is also preserved when they are interacting with the human. So, um, so that's about uh, the task model and the uh, mental model. Um, the hum human error planning is not complete unless you look at the entire uh, process of not only behavior but communication as well because not everything can be uh, signaled through behavior. So even if you have, um, if you ha even if you have reconciled models, uh, there might still be uh, different behaviors that are possible. So you need to communicate your intent, uh, or you may need to communicate your explanations in the form of different uh, forms of, uh, of interaction modularities. So uh, in the last part of the thesis, I look at this um, idea of uh, mixed reality interactions to help uh, human-robot teaming. Uh, the particular thing that we look at here is, this, um, is, a, is a way to get out of the ambiguity in natural language interactions and look at uh, specific ways in which we, ha we can communicate intentions to the human in the loop using natural language vocabulary. So the key, um, the key idea here is can we use a, diff uh, a much more constrained vocabulary to disambiguate inter interactions at the time of execution? Uh, can we use that to generate plans that are easier to communicate? And can we use that to uh, reconcile models as well? And this leads to this idea of uh, projection-aware planning, where you're, where you're not only communicating intentions at the time of execution, but at the planning time, you are changing your plans based on how it easy it is to communicate. So the setup kind of looks like this. Uh, you could uh, talk to the robot through the mixed reality cues, and the robot talks back to you in the, in the form of those cues. Uh, this forms a much more constrained vocabulary, and you can talk in those terms and how it changes the plan of the robot and how it changes your perception of what the robot is doing. In, 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 in terms of planning, the, the specific thing that we looked at is the idea of um, action and state value projections to uh, project out parts of the domain. I won't go into the details, uh, but the general idea is to uh, have a domain-independent vocabulary by which we can have these interactions. And of course, a mixed reality can be applied outside of um, outside of uh, human-robot teams in, in communicating with the cars, in decision support systems, um, in, embed, in uh, embodied systems like smart rooms, etc. Um, and so the same topics will find applications again and again in different settings like this. So uh, in, in conclusion, uh, I looked at these uh, three different models that uh, you can uh, work with in order to uh, build human-aware systems. Um, and I looked at uh, many different applications of it in the thesis. I covered some of it in here in terms of applications with the human robot scene. Um, but there's also a separate line of work on how to apply the same concepts in, in terms of decision support. Um, and uh, these are the, the red ones of the papers that I covered briefly in this talk. Uh, and the work has gotten uh, a lot of uh, uh, impact and support from the community. And, uh, and finally, a thank you to the, uh, my lab mates, my ASU, IBM, and especially to my advisor, Rao, for making this work possible. So I will end here, and we'll be happy to take questions. Questions for the speaker? What is the most annoying human thing that planning systems have to deal with? I would say suboptimality, um, because humans are not great planners. And so one of the, I guess, one of the biggest future works that comes out of this is to how to deal with the fact that they would, won't be making the right plans, or even sound plans, per se. Uh, and dealing with that complexity is hard. Yeah. I guess some stuff. I think the battery on the other wireless is dead. Um, next question. Do you see any need to go deeper? I don't mean like deep learning deeper. I mean like nested model of model uh -huh. of model. Or is, is this sufficient? Have you found science yeah. where you? Uh, there's actually out? some literature on how deep you need to go to model uh, interactions. And usually the idea is uh, one level deep is enough for most applications. Um, but yeah, you could go deeper, but we couldn't find much use of that, yeah. 
at, at some point, it's a, like a trade-off between the, actually the complexity of finding things as well. OK, right. one last question while, while we're waiting for the next person to get set up. Do you want to set it up? Yeah. yeah. You can, you can start that. Uh, did you consider any antagonistic models? Um, no, most of my work was in uh, collaborative C, but uh, there is also uh, work from a lab that looks at the other side of the coin. So you can think of the other side. So if you are being explicable, you can al also use the same techniques to be to op obfuscate your actions. Say, make it less, make it more harder for the uh, for the human to detect what you are doing. And the talk after this talk, I will talk about some of that work. All right, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Our next talk will be given by Diego, and it'll talk about model recognition as planning. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Diego, and I will be presenting the task of model recognition as planning. So first question, what is model recognition? This is a new task in which it is assumed that we have observed an agent acting and that we have a number of hypotheses about the, the models that govern the behavior of this agent. The goal is to identify the model that better explains the behavior we have observed. And for that, we are going to follow a probabilistic approach that will run higher models that require less changes in order to explain the observation. So we can understand model recognition as a classification task where the classes are defined as planning models. And the example to classify is the partial observation of a plan execution. And regarding the, regarding the observation, in our observation model, we define a trajectory as the interleaved sequence of states and actions resulting from the execution of a plan, and an observation as an incomplete trajectory, so that the initial state is fully known, and the final state is at least partially observed. And we will also be saying that a trajectory and an observation are consistent if the observation is a subsequence of the trajectory. So now for some examples of the kind of observations that we support. We have partial plans, like the ones used in plan recognition as planning, where the observation contains only some of the actions of the original plan. We can also work with observations consisting of partially observed states, like the ones that, that would be gathered using sensors. Or in the worst case, the minimal observation contains only the initial state and uh, the final state or goal condition. So now for the task definition. We define the model recognition task as a tuple consisting of three elements. The first element is the set of planning models that define our hypothesis set. The second element is the observation to classify. And both the models and the observations share the same fluence and the same actions, although the preconditions and actions of, the flu of, the, of each model vary from one to another. So, the last element are the prior probabilities for each of the planning models. And the solution to this task is the subset of models that maximizes the following base classifier. So since the prior probabilities are an input to the task, the, the next step is to model this likelihood. And for that, we follow this Bayesian network in which it, um, the dependencies between the, editing, the input model, the edited model, the trajectory and the observation are defined. And according to this Bayesian network, this is the expression to compute the likelihood, in which we can identify three different probability distributions related to the concepts of editing, synthesis, and sensing. So the editing probability is the probability of reaching the edited model from, by transforming the input model. The synthesis probability is the probability of producing the trajectory with the, edit, with the edited model. And the sensing probability is the probability of, pre of perceiving the observation from the trajectory. 
Still, this computation as it is is intractable given the two sums and especially the fact that the set of trajectories is potentially infinite. So we will be making some assumptions in order to approximate it. The first assumption says that agents will perform the least amount of adjustment to its model needed in order to explain the observation. This is like a rationality principle, but applied to the editing process. And following this assumption, we'll say that the first sum is dominated by its largest term, which corresponds to the closer model to the input model that can explain the observation. And by explain, we mean that it can produce a trajectory consistent with the observation. The second assumption says that a model can only produce one trajectory consistent with the observation, and any such trajectory is equally likely. So following this assumption, the sum for the trajectories will have at most one term, and the synthesis and sensing probabilities for this trajectory will be constant. So the second with, the, with the second assumption, we are discarding the cost of the trajectory, which can be too hard an assumption in some cases, especially when the observation is highly incomplete. So during the evaluation, we will, evaluate, we will assess when it is reasonable to make this assumption. Well, I'm sorry. Everything I have explained so far is general for any planning model, but now I will explain how to compute, how to model this editing probability, in particular for strips models. And since we are assuming rationality, I will be talking about edit distances. So in this diagram, we have the input model on the right, a number of edited models that can be reached from the input model, and an observation. Some of the edited models can explain the observation, like M1 and M2, while M3 and M4 cannot. We define the edit distance as the number of edit operations in, for strips, it's the insertions and deletions of preconditions and effects that we need to perform on the input model in order to transform it into an edited model. And the observation edit distance as the distance to the closest model that can explain the observation. So in this example, while M3 is the closest model to the input model, M2 is the closest model that can explain the observation. So by definition, this M2 model is the M star model, the closest model, and the, the observation edit distance will be the distance from the input model to this model, which is five for this example. Using these distances, we will model the editing probability as a Bernoulli process. So what we have is the probability of, edis of the addition raised to the number of additions, and the probability of, of the non-addition raised to the number of non-additions. So the number of additions is given by the distance between any two models. The probability should be lower than 0.5, given that we are assuming rationality, so that the, uh, so, the, so that the closer models will be more likely. And this n is a constant for, the, for each domain, which defines the maximum number of edit operations. But since we are only interested in the edit probability for the MSTAR model, Instead of using the edit distance, we will use the observation edit distance. So next step, I'm going to explain how to compute this distance using planning. So what we do is compile a new planning problem for each of the input models in which we extend the set of actions of the original domain with actions for the edit operations. So insertions and deletions for the preconditions and effects. And these new actions operate over a new set of fluents which are used to encode the different models. So an insert action will set, them, will set up this fluence to true, while a delete action will set them to false. The solution to these problems looks something like this. We have in the first part of the solution, we have all the actions needed in order to, be, to transform the input model into the MSTAR model. And on the second part of the solution, we have the actions needed in order for the MSTAR model to produce a trajectory consistent with the observation. So in this case, given that we have seven edit operations, the observation edit distance will be seven. Now for the evaluation, we have defined two settings. The first one is failure identification in a non-deterministic block wall, 
So we have a, an undeterministic block goal that can fail in different ways, in particular three ways, like for example, that a stack can drop the block on the table. And the second setting is a navigation policy recognition in the visitable domains, similar to the example I have been used during this presentation. So for the first setting, uh, we have defined three different deterministic models, each one encoding a different uh, type of failure. For each, of this mo for each model, we have built 10 trajectories, and from these trajectories, we have extracted a total of 330 observations. For the navigation policy, each policy defines a different way to traverse the grid. So we have eight policies, each one defining one trajectory. And from these trajectories, we have extracted a total of 88 observations. We also make a further distinction between these two settings in which in the first one, we, the observation has information about the length of the actual trajectory, like for example, knowing all the intermediate states, while in the second one, we don't know the length of the actual trajectory. Since this is a classification task, I am using accuracy to evaluate the performance of the approach, which is the percentage of correct predictions. And we will measure this accuracy on observations with no actions and zero to 100% observability, which is a parameter that measures the completeness of the states. So at 0%, we only have the initial and final states, and at 100%, we have the in all the intermediate states, and they are complete. And this setup will also help us assess when it is reasonable to make this second assumption. This is the plot for the accuracy. On the x-axis, we have on the x-axis we have the degree of observability, and we can see that for the bounded setting. Starting from, from 20%, we can expect results of accuracy in the order of 100, 90 to 100% accuracy, while we need to, to wait until 40% uh, observability for the search space to be constrained enough for this, this second assumption to be reasonable. Also, uh, we can see here one of the limitations of this approach at 0%. This is because this is for the navigation policy recognition, so we only have the initial state and final state, and, there, and any of the input models can actually explain this observation. So the, the limitation is that when all the models, or when, when multiple models can explain the observation, we don't have a way to discriminate between them. This is because the second assumption is saying that the, it's not taking into, cost, into account the cost of the trajectory. So going forward, our plan is to relax this second assumption so that we can distinguish uh, even in the cases where we have several models uh, being able to explain the observation. And that implies defining the synthesis probability as a function of the cost of the trajectory and generalizing the, the sensor model so that it is no longer only a question of uh, consistent or inconsistent with the, with the observation but which trajectory is more, consist more, proba more likely given this particular observation. Um, for the last part, we have this software for, have the model recognition software as well as the model learning software as planning available in this public repository. So thank you. Questions? Well, I have one. So suppose that um, your rationality will work, but uh, you have adversaries in the environment that will block the capacity for you to follow your best plan, or suppose that the environment itself has been designed so that the agents can't follow that. Uh, have you thought about that? So that the agents can't follow that. Can't follow rationality, right? So they're going to violate. Yeah, but rationality at this point is applied only to the editing process. Going forward, we want to apply rationality also to the synthesis probability. Mm -hmm. And by doing that and also generalizing the sensing probability, we will be able to distinguish, to distinguish uh, which paths are more likely given the actual environment. So th that should help in that regard. Um, 
thanks you for a nice talk. So I have a question related to how you are determining the models and classification. So I assume you have some kind of prior for your models. How do you set the prior in this process? Okay, so for, the, for this evaluation, if you don't have any additional knowledge, uh, you just assume that they are equiprobable. Or you can have a set of example and extract the, the prior using a sizable enough set of examples. So that is purely experimental at this point. I, I don't have another answer to that. One final question. Okay, well let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. might recognize our next speaker. Uh, this is Tathagata, and he'll be talking about the emerging landscape of interpretable robot behavior. All right, I'm back. Um, so this talk would be somewhat following from my previous one, but we will go into more details of a particular line of work on what we call interpretable agent behavior. Um, so this is joint work with Anaga, Sarath, Dave, and Rao. Um, from ASU. All right, so we'll start with a non-controversial statement. So in order to work with humans in the loop, to collaborate with them, to team with them, uh, you need to be interpretable to them. And so that would mean uh, that the human can understand what you're doing, uh, they can anticipate what you're doing. And so uh, we will go into much more detail of what this word interpretable means in the context of uh, human robot or uh, human agent teams in general. So um, in the previous talk, we talked about this idea called explicability. Uh, there we were talking about how do you produce plans that are expected in the observer model. So if, if, there's, an, uh, if there's a human in the loop, they would have expectations of you. How do you produce behavior that conforms to them? Uh, there's also this notion of predictability where you are trying to make sure that the human can tell exactly what you are going to do next. Um, so there you are trying to make sure that the human can complete your behaviors. So you are trying to help in plan recognition. Um, there's also this idea of legibility, where you are trying to make sure that the uh, uncertainty over different possible models uh, is reduced from the observer's point of view. And so part of that model might be goals. So if the agent thinks you have different goals, how can you signal which one you are doing through your behavior? So there you are trying to help in goal recognition. So uh, the, the, the landscape of uh, interpretability is basically a combination of one or more things, uh, one or more of these things, uh, where you are trying to uh, optimize a dif uh, different version of what, what is being interpreted by the human in the loop. And this talk and this paper is about uh, going through these different terms and finding a common vocabulary, a common framework with which we can talk about these things and try to point out what the outstanding challenges are, what, what are the curious differences between these algorithms, and so on. Um, so in this talk, I won't go into any new algorithms. I will just talk about these ideas and try to point out the differences among them. Uh, before we go there, uh, a brief overview of the terms that we'll use. So we have the standard uh, planning problem with the domain theory, current and initial, uh, initial and goal state. Um, and so as when we mention a planning problem, we will mention all three, including the domain theory, initial and goal state. And the solution to that is a plan, um, and a behavior is an instantiation of that plan. So what the observer observes is a behavior, and not a general plan in general, which may have loops and so on. And then you have a partial plan whose completion set is denoted by uh, the set over the tilde pi. And of course, you have an observer model which uh, maps an action state pair to a token. And that the observer will be using that token to interpret different parts of your behavior. So this is all standard stuff. Uh, the two new things that we will talk about 
in the talk is this idea of a computational model uh, of an agent. So that can be the sound, in which case you are making plans that work. Uh, it could be satisfying, in which you are making good plans. It could be optimal, where you are making the best plan. Um, and so this computational model is a, is a property of an agent and an, or an observer. Um, and so it's how they compute plans. And we also have this notion of a, com of a completion function, which kind of tells you how uh, a plan was completed. So a completion function takes in the computational model of the agent, uh, the current state, and the plan, and then produces a different state. So when we say uh, the plan was completed with the computational model of optimality for, from the initial state with plan pi, and it takes you to goal uh, g, we say that means that pi was the optimal plan for that planning problem. All right. Uh, some of these will come back during the talk, and we can make more sense of this at that time. So coming back to this idea of explicability, uh, one of the things that we talked about previously was this idea of model differences. The key reason behind why things may be non-explicable uh, or unexplicable is, is when the expectations of the uh, human differ from the actual model of the robot. So here on the right, we have the model of the robot and the optimal plan in that model pi star MR. Uh, and on the left, we have the, the model that the human thinks the robot has. And the optimal plan there is pi star MRH. Um, and when they differ, that's when we say that the optimal plan the robot made is inexplicable. And the point of explicability is to get as close as possible to what the human expects. So here's an example. Um, so it's the simplest example uh, you could think of. It's a small grid world. There's a goal right in front of the robot, uh, except that the robot has an arm sticking out on the right. And it thinks that if it goes forward, it might hit the wall. So the optimal plan that the robot is thinking of is the red one. Um, but from an observer who doesn't know about the internal constraints of the robot, uh, for the observer, the, the, the correct plan to do here is the one that goes straight to the goal. So if you see the robot doing the red plan, you would think, why? Right? So that's the inexplicable plan here. But actually, that's optimal for the robot. So if you are planning explicably, you would want to pro uh, produce the green plan if possible. So uh, going back to our uh, framework, we have here an agent. Um, with their own planning problem uh, and their computational model. And we have an observer with their copy of the same. And the target is to solve both the problems. We want to solve the agent's planning problem, uh, but we want to also make sure that that solution has a completion in the observer model. So um, here the, the thing that we are trying to find out is uh, the I guess the pointer isn't working. But yeah, so we are trying to find out uh, tilde pi, which is um, the partial plan that would be explicable to the observer. And the first constraint says that that has a completion um, in the agent model. And the second constraint says that has a completion in the observer model as well. So a couple of interesting things to notice here is that the goals of the agent and the observer models may be different. So that means that even if the behavior is explicable to the, to the observer, they might be doing it for a completely different reason. So as long as the behavior is fine, the observer wouldn't know that it was done for a different goal. And that's fine, because still that's the behavior they would expect. So there is no need for the goals to be the same. Um, there's another interesting part to notice in the, in the second constraint. Uh, we are saying that there exists one, at least one completion. Uh, that means that we are saying that the observer would be fine as long as there is one explicable completion of the solution. You could flip that and turn it into a for-all uh, constraint, in which case we will say it's a more pessimistic human. And the human wants all possible completions to be explicable. So um, a slightly different change to the, um, to the formulation can change how exactly we are modeling the human. Um, one of the things that this formulation does not cover is this idea of um, a spectrum of explicability. So this one is either you are explicable or not. Uh, but usually, uh, there are certain works that have looked at the spectrum and say that if no explicable plan exists, uh, how can we actually find one that's actually as close as possible? Um, so that's not really captured in this formulation. 
Uh, but we, if we look at the existing work in this uh, category, uh, one of the things that, um, one of the interesting parts that comes out is this idea of trying to estimate the human expectation, uh, because oftentimes these are not available for free. So what you want to do is to um, ask humans to label your plans and try to learn the expectations from them. So the first two uh, works are looking at this uh, possibility of learning the expected model. One of the things that comes out of uh, being able to learn that uh, is that you can have an implicit modeling of what the computational model of the observer is. Because in labeling what your plans are to them, they're implicitly saying how much they can compute. Uh, whereas if you have the computational model separately, and um, so for example, in the, in the third work, it assumes that the computational model is optimal, um, and the model is also known, um, then you have to deal with the fact that the humans may not actually correspond to that uh, computational model. One of the interesting uh, things about the third work is that it deals with the fact that there may not be fully explicable plans and allows you to uh, balance out explicability with this idea of explanations that we talked about in the previous talk. The general idea is that if, if the observable model is so that it doesn't produce an explicable plan, you can use explanations to change the observer model. And changing that observer model is in the form of explanations and communication. So that's explicability. Uh, one of the interesting things to note in explicability is that we only said we are going to produce a plan that the observer expects. Um, we didn't say which one of those expectations. And in general, given a planning problem, there might be many, many ways to solve it. If you're looking at an optimal uh, completion model, then there may be many, many optimal plans, and all of them are explicable, but they are not predictable. So here, in predictability, we are looking for um, plans that are easy to comp uh, complete for the observer. So going back to the uh, grid world, uh, we have, uh, there is no model difference here. There's a single goal, but there are many, many optimal plans to get there. So if the observer model here is an optimal completion model, they would think that all three possible plans uh, are explicable, but only one of them is predictable, which is the green one. Because once you take the first step, um, then you know exactly which plan is going to happen. So the point of predictability is to disambiguate the future, future actions. So we go back to the uh, formulation. Uh, the inputs are the same. The output is almost the same, except that instead of solving in both the models, we are solving uh, the agent's problem. And then we are also maintaining that we have the fewest completions in the observer model. So the previous constraints from explicability come back in here. But we have an additional uh, optimization term where we minimize the number of uh, plans that are possible. Um, so going back to the existing literature on this, uh, some of this uh, work actually started in the uh, robotics community uh, in motion planning. Um, and one of the, and you may have heard some of this in Uncle's talk on the first day, uh, some, one of the interesting features of motion planning versus task planning here is that the observer model is often implicit and default because state lines are the shortest paths. And so in motion planning, you do not need to explicitly model what the, uh, what the expected, what the, uh, what the observer model is. Uh, but in task planning, that becomes more crucial because you don't know exactly what exactly is in the mind of the observer. Uh, you can't make the assumption that everybody thinks the shortest path is the, is the best path. So that's one difference with, uh, with, the, uh, with the continuous planning uh, cases. Another interesting uh, thing that comes out in the related work is this idea of uh, not goals are equal. Um, so, so for example, in the, in the formulation, we looked at this uh, minimizing term, and we said we are going to reduce the cardinality of possible goals. Um, but as, a, as an observer, what you really want to is, uh, do is to possibly stop the agent from doing certain things. So one of the things that would be important to you are the features of those goals, not just the number of possible goals. So that's something that comes out in the work as well um, on modeling the diversity of the, the goals that are possible given the behavior. Uh, in general, I, I should say that uh, predictability is not, uh, not 
to be confused with explicability. So for example, um, here in this example, uh, we, we saw this case where the explicable plan um, may not be, um, so here we have three possible explicable plans, but only one of them is predictable. So, but this goes both ways. So any, uh, just as an explicable plan may not be unpredictable, may be unpredictable, uh, a predictable plan may be uh, inexplicable in the online setting. So in this case, uh, if the robot actually did the red plan, which is inexplicable, uh, after one step, the, the plan is actually predictable because you know exactly what the rest of it is, even though it's not part of the explicable plan. Um, but in the offline sense, the predictable plan is always one of the explicable plans. Okay, so that's about explicability and predictability. Um, the, the last thing that I would touch on is this idea of legibility or transparency. Um, and here we are trying to resolve the uncertainty over the agent model. And in particular, oftentimes the part of the agent model that's looked at is the goal. So we want to uh, signal what goal the agent is doing. But uh, in general, it can, it can be any part of the agent model. So it could be something about the action model as well. So going back to the example, uh, grid model example, we have here a set of possible goals that the observer thinks that the agent might be doing. And the, uh, the real one is the one on the, on the right. And so the agent can actually signal that through his behavior by taking the step on the right. Uh, whereas the red one uh, is less legible because it still leaves open all the other possibilities. So this is assuming uh, an optimal completion model of the observer. So going back to the, uh, to the framework, uh, the inputs are almost the same, except that the um, observer has a set of possible models in mind. And what the target here is that we want to solve the problem for the observer. For, we want to solve the problem for the agent and in the least number of models of the observer. So, um, so if, that's the, if, if the models are only parameterized by the goal, we want to minimize the number of goals that are possible. So the first uh, term here says uh, solve the problem for the agent, and the second term says minimize the number of possible models where the completion exists in the observer. And um, the, the notion of legibility also came out of the uh, robotics community in motion planning, and the same uh, discussion is also kind of valid here, uh, because you can make the assumption of a default uh, model of shortest uh, paths, um, which is not actually uh, does not translate to task planning. Uh, and you can also talk about the diversity of goals and plans as, as before. So um, before I end, I would uh, like to point out a few of the open areas in these, uh, in these uh, topics. Um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the things that we are looking at right now is to model these interactions in terms of epistemic effects on the observer model. So how does the, how does the agent's actions produce ep epistemic effects on the model of the observer? And that can allow you to compile some of these problems into, uh, for example, classical planning problems, which you can use, where you can use all the heuristics to speed up the planning process. So you don't have to explicitly deal with the mental model or the observer model in your search process. Um, one of the, th the recurring themes that we talked about is this idea of diversity of uh, the uh, distribution, observed distribution, which would be over goals or plans, um, and how that impacts the observer. Um, none of those work really look at the impact on the observer, uh, and so that's an area that we could look at. Um, one of the, uh, the areas that we are exploring right now is this idea of design for interpretability, where you can say that can we actually design some of the environment uh, in order to incentivize different kinds of um, interpretable behavior. Um, one of the things that I mentioned uh, at the beginning is that all of this has to do with uh, behaviors versus plans. So we all, what, you, what, the, what the observer observes is a behavior of the agent. But in general, you can talk about the same concepts in, in terms of plans, uh, which is a much more general uh, formulation. Um, because the behavior is just one instance of that plan. And most of the works in the existing literature do not uh, look at plans in general. And finally, um, almost all of the works look at these ideas in isolation. 
And once you start combining them, so if you have model differences, but you also have a set of possible models that the observer would be thinking of, these ideas become much more uh, difficult to contain. And uh, it would be interesting to see if uh, there, there are uh, algorithms that can be developed that can deal with one or more of these together. Um, I would end by pointing out that I only covered the cooperative uh, side of things. There's a, you could flip all the uh, equations and end up with the uh, adversarial side of things. So for example, for legibility, we said that we are going to minimize the cardinality of uh, possible models. You could turn that into a maximization and say we are going to maximize the possible things that are uh, possible in the observer model, in which case you get uh, behaviors such as obfuscation uh, where you're trying to obfuscate which model you're working with, um, and the security in where you're uh, trying to obfuscate which uh, uh, plans you are trying to achieve, et cetera. So, uh, so the same kind of techniques uh, can give you both of these uh, behaviors. And if you are interested in more details about this, uh, please look at the paper. It provides a more comprehensive survey of each of these ideas. So thank you. We'll take questions. Questions? I have one. So are you familiar with theory of mind, or did, did you have one? No, I didn't. OK. I, I must have used it here. So a lot of these approaches rely on the assumption that the agent or observer is rational or completely optimal. So how are these algorithms impacted if you relax that for suboptimal, noisy, rational behavior? Right. So well, so not all of them depend on that. So for example, if you're learning the uh, expected model through, uh, say, if you're providing plant traces to the human and asking them to label them, then you don't just get the model. You also get the implicit uh, computation power of those humans. So for example, in some of the works I discussed on learning models for explicability, uh, if the humans are providing labels on things that are explicable versus they are not, then they are not just providing the model, they are also providing whether they can compute the explicability of that plan. So if you're learning those models, usually they come together. So that's one way to get out of the computation issue. But yes, so one, the works that have uh, considered that the model is known, they have also considered that the agents are rational. Yeah, you said for degree of explicability might be something you want to look at, but mm -hmm. you also gave two options of saying it might be there exists one continuation or for all continuations. So mm -hmm. Why not use that as your spectrum? So of all the continuations, how many of them actually work out for the observations you see? Right, so I guess that continuation begins after the continuation, right? So even if you do exist one, that may not exist. And so in those cases, what some of the works that have uh, looked at the cases where explicability doesn't exist, you can do plan distance measures to say how close it is to the actual explicable plans um, and try to learn the, the explicability score in terms of known plan distance measures. And so we have some of that work from our lab. Um, but you could also look at the other spectrum as well, yeah, that we haven't looked at. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Welcome. Oh, just uh Our next talk will be given by Sarah, who will talk about efficient heuristic search for optimal environment redesign. So hi, this is joint work with uh, Luis, uh, Victor, Erez, and Shlomo, most of which are in the crowd today. Uh, what we're going to talk about is a framework we call Equi Reward Utility Maximizing Design. I'm going to use ERUMD for short. The objective here is to find ways to redesign stochastic environments in order to maximize agent performance. So the input of our problem is a stochastic environment, an agent, a description of an agent and its reward function, and a set of modifications that we can apply to the environment. What we want to find 
is a valid sequence of modifications that maximizes the agent's utility. Now this is a special case of a broader problem that I like to call utility maximizing design where we are uh, looking at different utility functions and the best way to design environments for the sake of utility. Uh, one of them is Go Recognition Design, which I think is why I'm in this session. So to now today we're not talking about a, a, a Go Recognition, but rather we're designing environments in order to make sure that uh, agent performance is maximized. It is very closely related to work that you can see tomorrow by Silva et al, where they're reconfiguring MDPs. Uh, is similar, it's very similar to our setting, but they are conti considering continuous uh, design domains. So uh, a bit more formally, what we have here are three components that we get as input. One of them is an initial stochastic environment with state, actions, and an initial state. We, uh, uh, the second component is the agent component, where we have a reward function that describes the way agent accumulate reward in the environment and a discount factor. Now, yeah, as, you may have, uh, as, you may, as you may see, the initial environment plus the agent gives us the initial MDP, right? The, 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 the uh, discounted infinite horizon mark of decision process, as you uh, may know. Uh, and, uh, but we also have a third component, which is this, the design component. Here, we are given a set of possible modifications, a deterministic transition function that defines the effect of modifications, and a, a constraint function that defines the constraints we have on the design process. For example, we may have a budget that limits the number of uh, design options that we may have. Um, and we are in this, uh, what, we are, what we want to find is a valid sequence of modifications that maximize the agent's agent utility. So before uh, going into a, a, a specific example, let me motivate this work by describing various applications where we think this work can apply. So many, in many stochastic settings, we, can, uh, we have a limited way to apply design and we want to efficiently uh, find uh, the best way to apply design. So for example, in a, in a computer network where we may have the option of fixing some uh, communication channels or in a road network where we can apply sensors where we have multiple users and we want to understand where are uh, uh, those uh, costly sensors should be placed. Another very simple example that I will use as a running example, think of your Roomba in your home. It's a stochastic model because the agent, it's a stochastic environment because the agent may fail and we need to decide how to redistribute furniture, furniture in, 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 a, in a room to make sure that the robot can achieve its goal as quickly as possible. Or in this example, in this running example, let's assume that there are, this is the stochastic environment. What we see in the bottom is the robot in the black circle. There are furniture that are these distributed, pieces of furniture that are distributed in the room, which are the uh, shaded cells. And there are also pieces of dust, right? The, the, those stars that the agent needs to collect, right? So this is an MDP with uh, rewards that the agent gets when it collects uh, the dust. And what we need to decide is we can't remove all the furniture from the home and we can't add as much as we want. We have a budget to decide that what is the most effective way. For example, we have three pieces of furniture that we can remove. Which are the best ones to uh, remove? Uh, so uh, this was this is a problem we present in, in, in each case 17 and there we presented two approaches for this solution. The first one is a compilation to planning. We exploited the fact that the design objective here is aligned with the agent's objective and we basically just compiled the design action into the uh, agent model and, sol and found the optimal solution by solving uh, the agent's problem. The second approach is what we call best first design, which is a best first search in the modification space. And uh, as you can see in the diagram, on the, on the top, pa top part of the diagram, we have our third space, which is the space of modification sequences. Each of the nodes uh, in our search corresponds to a tip node, which is a modified environment where no more design is applicable. Where, when do we stop a best first search? When uh, we, oh sorry, so we, when we perform a best first search by populating a queue with uh, a, a probability, a priority queue with the heuristic values and we keep extracting the best node. When do we stop? We stop when the best node is a tip node. And in this case, when we have, a, a, when we use an admissible heuristic, and I'll describe in a minute what that means, when our, a, when our extracted node is a modified environment 
and there were no so from the from the uh, a modified environment where no more design is applicable, then we know we found the best solution. So in order, what is missing here is that I need to tell you what admissibility means in this case. So what, right, we are evaluating modification sequences. What is an admissible estimation of the value of a modifi modification sequence overestimates the value of design. And we can use a, a, a very common approach to extract a, a admissible heuristic uh, suggested by Perel uh, back in 88, where we can extract a, a admissible heuristic by obtaining, a, by solving a simplifications of the original problem. So in, in each case 17, what we suggested is to relax the environment and evaluate the value of change by applying it to a relaxed environment. For example, an environment where with no delete effects or with no probabilities. Here, what we are suggesting, and this is the novelty of, of today, uh, today's presentation, is that we're suggesting the simplified modification heuristic. So we are suggesting to evaluate the value of a modification by the value of a modification that dominates it. So dominates means here achieves a utility that is at least it is high. And this can be done in two ways, or at least the ones that we suggest. One of them is just basically find a way to a, 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 a dominate modification that is easier to compute. For example, if I have a, a sensor with a, some a probability a distribution over the outcomes, I can ignore them and just assume that I have a sensor that can perform a, a deterministically. But more importantly for today, we uh, can actually use these values and cache them uh, uh, sorry, cache them and reuse them for future computations and save a, a lot on a computation cost. So the way, uh, so let's go back to our uh, uh, robot example. We have this stochastic environment and there, it's very big, of course, not, uh, it's not possible to uh, uh, exhaustively explore it. So what we do is we partition the environment into zones. We can do this in various ways, but here we are just gonna take the grid and partition it. And when we want to estimate the value of a single piece of furniture indicated by this uh, blue arrow, which I hope you see, we basically remove all the furniture from, from the entire zone. And we reuse this value whenever we want to uh, compute the value of individual, uh, individual modifications. What we get is basically a table where we store pre-computed values and we, uh, sorry, yeah, we, pre we store computed values and we reuse them whenever uh, necessary. Now, where would this be effective? This would be effective when modifications of these uh, 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 meta-modifications are useless. Right? When the uh, dominating modification, this padded, this sequence of modifications is useless, this will be effective in our search because our heuristic value will make sure that we do not have to extract these nodes and a lot of computations will be saved. So what I told you so far is how do, what, uh, uh, why we would need dominating modifications to estimate the value of design. I talked about the admissibility of such modifications and why caching can be effective, right? When we have many uh, design options that are redundant. What I still need to tell you, and I forgot to turn on my uh, <laughs> timer, uh, is that I, uh, have, I, we, we want an effective way to actually uh, extract these dominating modifications, right? We uh, want to do this effectively, and uh, we want to, uh, after we present this technique, we want to make sure that these are admissible and describe settings where such estimations are admissible. And uh, then I'll show you how we actually use uh, PDDL representations to uh, do this, uh, this, this process, process automatically. So the fact that we are using lifted representation make, makes it very easy to develop a technique that can be generalized across various settings. So how do we create dominating modifications? What we present in the paper are two ways. First is what we call relaxation. We generate modifications that are guaranteed to be at least as beneficial. And there we use a lot of techniques for class. We can use techniques that are used in classical planning for, for a, a computing heuristics. For example, we can ignore probabilities of failure and noise. The, the, the nice property about this approach is that it is always guaranteed to be admissible, very similar to, how the, to the uh, heuristic where we sh the admissibility of the heuristic of computing relaxed environment. If we just simplify the, the design, 
then uh, we are guaranteed to get ad admissible estimations. The other uh, technique that we show, and that's a bit uh, trickier, is what we call padding. So we take these modifications, that we, the modification that we want to uh, evaluate, but we pad to it, we append to it additional modifications uh, and uh, uh, estimate the value of the single modification by the value of the sequence. Now this is tricky because this is not necessarily admissible. Even if you think of my furniture uh, removing example, removing furniture or adding furniture is not always admissible, right? If a robot can, uh, can get stuck, maybe removing furniture is not a good idea if, if, if uh, the furniture that I can remove is, is in the corner, right? So admissibility is inherent in the model description, in the problem description, and we have to be very careful the, by the, in the way by which we uh, define monotonicity and uh, admissibility in this case. So uh, uh, the next level is actually how uh, to, we automatically generate uh, domi dominating modifications. So here, uh, PDDL comes into play and uh, is very, an, is, I, 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 we can apply these techniques very naturally. So what we use here is the fact that our modifications, our design operators are, uh, have lifted representations. For example, when I want to clear a cell, basically what I define, the design action that I define is clear cell XY. What I can use this is for automatically generating sequences. So we call this modification padding, where we map a grounded modification to a sequence of modification that share the same value. So clear cell 11 one is going to be evaluated by clear cell 11, clear cell 12, et cetera, et cetera. This is very handy when I want to compute the value of clear cell 12. I just reuse the value, as an I, and as I said, if the value, if this sequence is ineffective, then a computing the individual values is going to be redundant in my computation, and I can reuse these values without paying this extra cost. Um, so it, it, we do something very different for uh, modifications that change the probability. There we apply the all outcome determinizations, but in any case, the nice property of this is that it was very easy to implement using the PP, P, well, I use PPDDL because it's a probabilistic model, but basically uh, uh, the idea is that these uh, lifted representations made it very easy to implement. So what we get is a search in the space of modifications. We have a table where we keep, we store our values, re we reuse these values and avoid many redundant computations. The way we evaluated this by is, was by taking the same domains that we used for our each Chi 17 paper, but uh, we added, we made sure to add for, e, uh, for each domain at least two types of modifications. So our modifications either add actions to the model, remove furniture if you, uh, from, from the, or, uh, or, or uh, enable actions basically that were not enabled in the previous model, uh, and also change the probability distribution. So just as an example, in our vacuum, do, uh, vacuum cleaning domain, which is in the bottom, we can both in a, uh, remove furniture, but also uh, change the probability of success when moving to a destination, right? So we, uh, we, we call this add, add non-friction tiles, right? We reduce the probability of failure. We evaluated our, uh, our uh, instances using seven approaches. One is just a, an exhaustive search in the space of modification. The second was the compilation to planning. And we also uh, evaluated five heuristics uh, the, and the results are, uh, are extremely, uh, uh, well, they, they are, they, we got very uh, nice results for many of the domains. Some, some, in some domains, results, well, uh, the, 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 the results varied between domains. The, the, but the, but the, the point here is, for example, for the vacuum domain, which is geared toward design, we can see that using and reusing pre-computed values uh, yielded, yielded very effective results, right? So the, what you see in this table is those seven approaches and on the bottom uh, highlighted are the results that we got when we pre-computed values, right? We, we reduced time and we managed to solve more solutions. So of course the complete, complete results and a link to the database and the implementations are all in the paper. 
So to conclude what uh, I, uh, well, I discussed equi reward utility maximizing design, ERUND, which we first presented in each case 17, where we redesigned stochastic environments for maximizing user benefit. I presented the relaxed modification heuristic, so apply a modification that achieves more and uh, we can cache results for uh, similar nodes. I forgot to write here what we are intended for the future. So the future, in, in the future, what we mean to do is apply a, a hierarchical uh, form of this, uh, of this computation, right? If I compute a, 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 modifica a, a padded modification that is useless, uh, checking the, uh, the individual values of, uh, of sequence, of subsequences, or, or of, of sub-modifications is, is redundant. But if I have a value that actually indicates some change, there I would actually want to increase my granularity and maybe apply a more refined model. So a hierarchical approach for this, uh, the way I do padding. Uh, that's it. I'm uh, happy to take your questions. I've been hitting this side of the room a lot. Does, it, does evaluating the uh, utility of a modification require executing the agent against the modified environment? Yes, we are assuming at each node, and that is why our computation is so expensive. We have to, for each modification, we have to recompute the model. We haven't explored options of actually not uh, not doing that for each for each. What I mean by that is when I extract from from my search my queue. A evaluation, we call it an evaluation and execution environment, so the nodes on the bottom, there I actually have to compute the value for each domain. Thank you. Great question. Um, thanks. This is a good talk. So um, for the, you seem to have looked at the all outcome determinization as they do it in FF replan and so on. As, as the what? Sorry. So you looked at the all outcome determinization, you know, FF replan and all that stuff. But so the point you mentioned about the hierarchical thing in the summary, right, towards the right. end. Yes, yes. So there was this work, I think 2007 or 8, from Stuart Russell's group on angelic semantics. Have you taken a look at that? No. So I there it's basically about they assume that the world will resolve in favor of the planner. Mm -hmm. So that's like an optimistic uh, right. assumption. And that's basically based off of a hierarchical, you know, uh, setting. So I think there is no, a connection. It's, it's a here. great idea. This yeah. work was actually in inspired by uh, pattern databases, where we we looked at uh, ways to use uh, PDBs to actually extract easy, easier to compute environments. But here we're, I, but here we're we're not necessarily producing environments uh, solutions that are easier to compute. Just as long as we're making sure that we can reuse them in future iterations. But thanks, great, uh, great uh, pointer. Um, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's not my computer. Yeah. Okay, so nice work. Uh, I just thank realized you. that I also worked on a design problem, except we were trying to make the other guy's life miserable. <laughs> so like in network, network security, the administrator is trying to make, uh, you know, uh, it's a Stackelberg game. He's trying to make the value of the attacker less. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's a relevant point, but I wonder if this actually relates to what you're saying here, or it's exactly the same thing if you just inverse the rewards? I think I, uh, this is a great point. I think what would change here is the way we actually do design here. The, the nice proper, the proper, the fact that the utility of the agent and the utility of the designer were aligned allowed us to actually use a specific techniques and admissibility uh, proofs actually relied on the fact that utilities are aligned. If they're not aligned, like in the setting that you mentioned, we have to be more careful on the way we apply design. But I'd like to, I'd love to take this offline if, oops, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thanks our speaker one more time. Okay, our last talk is a short paper on finding centroids and minimum covering states in planning by Alberto. So, hi everyone. Um, consider this, this problem where a ranger has to put out a set of fires. If we frame this as a planning problem, the most common task uh, would consist of finding a, a plan, uh, a, a sequence of actions uh, to put out the, the set of fires. But, um, Imagine that these, these fires are uh, not current ones, but potential. In this case, we are no longer interested in, in finding uh, a plan, but we are interested in finding some states that keep some relationship within the, uh, with the goals. 
And in this work, we came up with two of, the, of, of those states. The first are the central states, we, in case the ranger uh, would like to be near most of the, of the goals, or minimum covering states, in case the ranger uh, wouldn't like to be far from any of them. So uh, finding these states may be useful in many applications, both in the cooperative and competitive sites, for example, in anticipatory planning or in goal obfuscation. And um, computing these uh, points in a geometric space is uh, really easy, since every point is reachable from any other, point features are fully specified, and the distance between points can be simply calculated. But uh, in planning, we have states instead of points, so every state is not reachable from any other, a state might not fully specify such as goals, and the distance between states cannot be simply calculated. So here we have our alternative planning task, which is a normal planning task, but now we have a set of potential goals inst instead of only a set of, a set of goals we want to achieve. Um, we will compute uh, uh, the set of, dint of distance from a given state to these uh, goals in the potential goal set, e and this computation will give us a tuples in the form goal and the distance to, to this goal set. And uh, we can compute this distance either using an heuristic estimator or the perfect heuristic by runner, uh, running an optimal planner. So back to our running example, uh, this would be our set of distances, um, uh, a distance of one, a cost one to the fire one, uh, of five to the fire, uh, uh, to the fire two, and so on. And from that set, we are going to compute some metrics, in this case, the, the average of that set, which is five, and the maximum value uh, within that set, which in, the, in this particular case is seven. And uh, with these uh, metrics, uh, we now can define uh, centric states and minimum covering states. The first are th the centric states, so a state would be a centric state of, of a planning task if its uh, average distance uh, uh, to, the goal, to, the, to the goals in the potential goal set is minimum among all the reachable states. And likewise, we define minimum covering states uh, to be the st those states that uh, have the minimum maximum value of all the states in the reachable state space. So to compute them, uh, we propose uh, an algorithm which, which can be seen as an instantiation of a grid best first search uh, algorithm since we are not taking into account the cost of reaching the states and it receives as input the planning task P, the function H used to compute the, the distance between states the evaluation function E used to sort the node in the open list, and the stopping condition O. And the algorithm returns us uh, a set of state S that minimizes the evaluation function E. So by varying this parameter, uh, we have um, six different versions of the algorithm. So we can, we can either use uh, an heuristic estimator, FF in this case, or the perfect heuristic estimator, H star, by running an optimal planner. We have two different evaluation functions. The first one uh, order the nodes in the open list by uh, the minimum uh, average distance and break ties in favor of, the, of those uh, minimum maximum distance. And the other does exactly the opposite. And uh, we have two stopping conditions, which, which are either to explore all the reachable state space or greedy stop the algorithm where, uh, when there is no better state in the open list than the best uh, state uh, found so far. So as instance, if we want to compute optimal centroids, we have to, uh, we have to explore all the reachable state space. From each state of, uh, in the uh, reachable state space, we are going to compute n optimal plans, where n is the, set, uh, is the number of uh, potential goals, and uh, we are always going to minimize the average distance to the goals in that set. So we run experiments in two domains with conflicting goals, which means that there is no state in the reachable state space in which uh, all the goals can be achieved together. And those domains are ranger, the one of our running example, and the blocks word domain with a little modifications. Uh, it's basically it's a blocks word domain where we want to, bu to build uh, different words. So th those are our goals. So here are, uh, you have uh, our table. Uh, we measure the, the first column goes to the domain, then the version, and the metric, which is uh, the, the average distance uh, of the state returned by the algorithm, the, the delta with, uh, with respect to the initial state, and the same for the metric of the maximum distance. But from that table, I just want you to know that as, as expected, the optimal algorithm, uh, which is very costly, is li uh, like a lot of more. It takes like uh, a lot of more time than the suboptimal versions. 
but uh, here we wanted to see how, how they behave. Uh, so here we measured the suboptimality ratio. We, uh, so we compare uh, the results uh, returned by the suboptimal version compared to the optimal one. So as we can see, uh, they don't behave that bad. So um, it, they are at most like uh, over two times suboptimal. So we can use them. And uh, we, it's really easy to visualize uh, uh, those states in a, in a grid or in a path planning-like domain, but we also wanted to see how they look like in blocks words. So here we have two different problems uh, from, bro from blocks words, and we have the initial state in the right. In the cloud, we have the, the potential goals, the words we want to build, and uh, in the right, uh, as instance in, in, the, in the last part, we have the, the optimal centroid, uh, C star, so as we can see here, uh, it already contains one word, uh, the word eat, from the set of potential goals, and also from that state, it's really easy to, to build other words such as bit. So wrapping up, uh, we came up with a novel planning task, that of finding centroid and minimum covering states in planning, which uh, we think it might be useful in many applications. And we propose uh, three algorithms, to optimal, uh, one optimal and two suboptimal, to compute them. And in future work, we would like to compute these states more efficiently by using uh, backward or symbolic search. Uh, we would like to add the uniform goal probability distribution and a cost bound since now we are not taking into account the cost of reaching those states from the initial. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs>